And the word of God reads in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black uh, with clouds and winds and, and there was heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. That's a, uh, I want you to focus on that word that he was riding on a horse. He rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah mightily. Somebody say, hand of God, come upon me. And he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. And Ahab told Jezebel that Elijah had, what Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let it be with the gods, let them do to me, if by this time tomorrow I don't do to you as, they, as you have done to them. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough now, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay... He fell asleep on the broom tree, and suddenly an angel touched him and said, Rise and eat. Wow. You may be seated. Hallelujah. It said that Elijah told the, the man, the king of Israel, listen to this. He said, There is a sound of abundance of rain, so Ahab went off to eat and drink. He listened to the prophet. It's all about listening. Remember that, okay? So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Power of prayer. And at the seventh time, like I explained to you guys, after the seventh time, finally the rain began to come. But I, I want to focus on, on this. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind arose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. Then the power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak to his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. 20 miles. Listen to me. From Mount Carmel to Jezreel, it's about 20 miles. And he ran ahead of a man that was riding on a horse. You got to, listen to me, you got to understand that when the power of God comes upon you, everything shifts. And what I'm saying is that a lot of us are trying to do things with our own strength and we get nowhere fast. But when you do it with the power of God, you advance. It's all about advancement. Hallelujah. And it's a possibility that you're in a place right now that you don't see advancement. And I'm just trying to teach you something that the possibility that you're not seeing advancement is because you're doing it with your strength. And God is saying, the moment that you do it with my strength, then I will advance you. We see that the prophet had to pray in order for this to happen. God is saying that a lot of us are trying to get things moving, but we're not seeking his face. That we're not praying, hallelujah. That we're not falling to our knees. So God can't move on your behalf. I told myself I wasn't going to preach today. I'm not trying to stream. I, I told myself, Javier, don't preach. Just teach. I'm going to try to do both of them at the same time. This story only gives me a lesson. A lesson of if I want to see the power of God, I can't just continue standing. I got to pray. I got to kneel to the ground. And this story also uh, shows me that when the power of God or the hand of God comes upon you, he advances you. Yes. Yes. The Bible says that he outran a horse. Yes. I call this God speed. You, it's a possibility that you're in a place right now that you feel like you've been defeated. That you feel like, God, I don't know how I'm going to overcome this or how I'm going to get through this. But I'm going to tell you right now that if you seek for the hand of God to come upon you, he knows what it is that you need already. Don't seek for what it is that you need because he knows that you need what it is that you need. But when you seek the face of God and make his kingdom your number one concern, the Bible says all the desires of your heart will fall in place. If that wasn't true, then God is a liar. And if God is a liar, then why are we serving him? 
We're serving him because we know he should because he's looked out before. But you got to think about the times that he looked out, what you did for him to move on your life before. We got to return to that again. We got to return to that first love that we seek him with all our hearts, that we're compassionate with him. Amen? You know, to those that didn't go to yesterday's uh, conference, I'm going to tell you something, right? That conference was powerful. It brought me back to a place of serving that because sometimes along the way we get callous, we get tired, and we say that we're doing all these things, but at the end of the day, we forget our purpose, servanthood. It was powerful. It's all about servanthood. It's all about serving one another with love and being in one accord because when we're in one accord, we're going to see the hand of God move. The prophet and his servant were in one accord. The prophet spoke a word and the king, though he was an evil king, was in one accord because he listened to the prophet and did exactly what the prophet said. He ate and drank. And what I'm trying to say is, let's just say, I'm not going to call myself a prophet, but a man that's speaking up here and giving you instructions from the word of God. Are you listening to the word that I'm giving you? And not just listening, but are you practicing? And if you're not practicing, it's a possibility that you're not going to see the abundance because you're not doing what I asked you to do. Rise and eat. For there's a sound of abundance of rain. If I say there's going to be a a sound of abundance of rain in your life, but you got to eat. And you wait for the rain, but you don't eat. You're not going to get the rain because you didn't listen to the details. Faith without works is dead. Faith without obedience is dead. Those who hear my word but do not put it into practice is like a man that builds his house on sand. Everything is going to come crashing down. On a raise of hand, if you're seeing things crashing down in your life, and it's fine because I've had things crash down in my life, but I analyzed what it was that I was doing and why these things are crashing. And when I analyzed what it is that I was doing, I wasn't practicing the word of God. I'm just being honest. But the moment that I begin to practice the word of God and I put his word to the test and I say, God, let's see. Everything begins to rise up again. Amen? So today's message is called Momentum. Look at your name and say Momentum. Momentum. As a matter of fact, speak it and prophesy it over their life. You're gaining momentum. I'm here to tell you that Shoreline Church is gaining momentum. I'm here to tell you that Life Water and Shoreline Church coming together are gaining momentum. I want to honor Pastor uh, Michael Kahlo and his wife. Because not many people will allow a young preacher that's on fire to come preach out of fear. But the Spirit of God, somebody say the Spirit of God. When you in one accord, the power of God has to move. And what God is doing in this time and age is prophetic. So I want to honor Pastor Michael Kahlo for standing in the place for many years. That many pastors would have quit a long time ago. Listen to me. Many pastors would have threw in the the towel and said, I'm done with this. I'm out of here. Because because he's blessed. He's blessed. He could have left a long time ago, but he stood his ground. And there's a crown in heaven for you. No matter what you did in your past, that doesn't determine who you are today. There's a crown in heaven for you. I feel the presence of God as I'm saying this. I know that the Holy Spirit is releasing this right now. And nobody will be able to take that crown from you. Amen? God established them in this region for a purpose. He's a pillar. Pillars don't fall. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. So the first point that I want to talk on is we have gained momentum. Amen? Amen? Whenever a church ministry or an individual is about to experience a powerful movement of God, a powerful movement of breakthrough, the sound of abundance of rain, because the harvest is attached to the rain, a strong spirit will always rise to try to stop you from whatever it is that God has called you to do. Whenever you are about to experience a great breakthrough, a strong spirit will always rise to stop the purpose that God has called you to. I'm going to tell you right now. Was last, year, I, 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 was last year a hard year for you? I'm pretty sure that the enemy tried getting you to quit. Throw in the towel. Because the enemy knows the times. Woo! 
I said the enemy knows the times. He knows when God's about to do something great in a place. And he may know it a couple of years ahead that he will put pressure on you and pressure on you and pressure on you so that you can give up so that the plan of God will not be completed in this region. But I'm here to say that the plan of God is going to be completed in this region. The visions you had years ago, the visions you had years ago are going to come to pass. Though the enemy don't want it. Though the enemy, even the people in this region don't want it. They're going to have to experience it because when God moves, hallelujah, nothing can stop it. We're going to break through. We're going to break through. We're going to, somebody say, we're going to break through. I ain't going to die. I'm breaking through. Hallelujah. We need to break through. Hallelujah. I'm breaking through in the name of Jesus. Ain't no devil going to hold us back. I'm going to make sure that, hallelujah, we're breaking through by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when the hand of God comes upon you, you will outrun every situation, hallelujah. And the hand of God is coming upon this ministry. The hand of God is coming upon the leaders. We're about to break through. So whenever breakthrough is about to happen, get this lesson. A strong spirit will always rise to take you off course or stop your momentum. Whenever you know that you've been standing and seeking God and you begin to feel attack, that's a sign that you're on the right course. So don't ever question God and say, God, is this your will? God, oh my God, I've been standing, but I haven't been seeing nothing. God is saying, this is my perfect will. I hope I'm answering some questions today. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. A strong spirit has risen to try to stop the momentum, to try to take you off course. Hallelujah. Wherever there is a prophetic move of God, the Jezebel spirit is sent on a mission to try to stop that prophetic move. The Jezebel spirit will always attack the prophetic move of God. And hear, hear me out. I'm not just talking about any other spirit. I'm talking about the Jezebel spirit. Keep in mind, she was a queen, so it's a principality. I wouldn't call her a woman or a man. I will call her a principality. Meaning that she, 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 she's over the heirs. She's taken over the heirs, over a, re- over a region, not just one place. To try to stop her, her main purpose, the main purpose of this spirit is to try to stop the prophetic move of God. Yeah. See, every spirit, every, every demonic spirit is sent on a mission for different purposes. But the Jezebel spirit is to stop the prophetic move of God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, all right. Keep in mind, and I'm going to say that I'll, I'll talk about it later. Um, in Acts chapter 16, verse 16, Paul cast a demon out of a woman that practiced uh, sorcery, that she was a fortune teller. That's what I would consider a a, a false prophetic spirit. And the Bible says that Jezebel called herself a prophetess. So keep in mind that the demon that was cast out of this this woman was a python spirit. A python spirit is, is called to choke the breath out of people. So whenever there's a prophetic move of God, because the prophetic move of God has to do with speaking, it's always trying to stop you from speaking. It's always trying to stop you from releasing. It's always trying to stop you from breathing. Amen? Okay. So now we see this. The Jezebel spirit is sent on a mission to interrupt, to target, and attempt to kill the momentum of anyone that's under the prophetic. And it doesn't have to do with being possessed, a a woman or a man being possessed because she's a principality. She sends other little spirits under her to go ahead and attack. Okay, a principality means that she's over the airwaves. She's sending messengers. We see in the Bible that she sent a messenger to Elijah. So whenever you you see, oh, she's possessed by the Jezebel spirit, it doesn't work that way. You got to understand how it works, okay? There's other demons under this spirit that are sent as messengers. Are we understanding now? So we see that she sent a messenger to try to put fear inside of the prophet. We're going to get to this, okay? Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, because we have authority, I want you to say this. Jezebel, Jezebel. you will not stop us. us. Speak to it. Say, Jezebel, Jezebel, 
the Lord Jesus rebukes you. I'm going to teach you guys something. You see how we're in one accord? There's more power when we're doing it together. Listen to me. Listen to me. A lot of us try to fight these demons with ourselves. And we can overcome. But when we do it together as one voice, it holds more power. Why? Because there's more breath. There's more air being released. That's a mystery. Amen? Amen. Are we enjoying this? I hope you guys are enjoying it. Amen? (laughs) Hallelujah. The ministry, Life Water Church, the ministry shoreline has gained momentum. Amen? Amen. Glory to Jesus. Now, I want to speak about prophecy because a lot of people don't know what prophecy is. When we speak about prophecy... We're not just speaking about a great prophet like Isaiah or, or, or minor prophets like, you know, like the ones that we read in the Bible. Elijah, Elisha, these were living prophets, a voice of God on earth. Amen? But also, you got to understand that when you preach Jesus, you hold the spirit of prophecy. you got to understand this. Whenever you preach or whenever you mention that name Jesus to try to set people free, You're releasing the spirit of prophecy. Because the Bible says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 10, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Within the last month, I'm not going to say week, but within the last month, have you spoke to anybody about Jesus? If you have, I want you to raise your hand. You spoke to people about Jesus. Praise God. Did you invite them to church? How many, how many, um, how many uh, guests we got here today? Raise your hand. First-time visitors. One, two, two first-time visitors. Amen. Praise God. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Amen. Glory to Jesus. I love to see visitors. Welcome, 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 welcome. We love you guys. Amen. So we read here in the book of Revelation 19.10, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I want you to know this because I'm going to teach you why it is that you go through what you go through and how to overcome it. If I don't teach you how to fight, if, 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 if this is an army, if, 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 I'm a, if I'm a commander and I don't teach you how to yield or use your weapon, you will never know how to overcome the enemy. We're called to build a great army, Amen. Heaven already has an army of angels, but we're called to build the body of Christ to be strong, to be able to fight against the principalities of darkness. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Your your, your battle is not against the person next to you. Your battle is not against your wife or husband, but it's against the principalities of darkness. Amen? Amen? So I have to teach you, I have to prepare the bride, I have to teach you how to be able to discern when it is that you're in warfare and learn how to fight this thing. So I want you to know, this is why I'm, I'm, I, I'm speaking about this, that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Whenever you speak the word Jesus, you're releasing the spirit of prophecy. Uh, Jesus said in the book of John 6, 63, I believe it is, my words are spirit and life. The air that you breathe, when you release a word, is spirit and it could come to life. That's why the word has power. That's why the power of life and death is in the tongue. You could bless somebody or you could curse somebody. The words that you release have life or they have death. But when you speak about Jesus, that is the spirit of prophecy. Are we understanding this now? So whenever you release Jesus, you become a target of Jezebel. Because Jezebel will always oppose the prophet. All right, put it like this. The spirit of prophecy, a true spirit of prophecy, will always oppose and expose the spirit of Jezebel. When you carry the true spirit of prophecy, because there's people that speak Christ, but out of that same mouth comes fresh water and dirty water. Come on now. Come on now. The Bible says keep your mouth clean. The Bible says out of the abundance of your hearts, your lips will speak. So we wonder why we don't have no true power. Because out of this mouth, we praise God, but with the same mouth, we curse people. But the true spirit of prophecy or the person that's really uh, sold out for Jesus will always oppose, 
right? Yeah. Oppose, right? I'm not saying my wife is a thing, but I'm going to pick on her because she's my wife. <laughs> Stand up real quick. You know, you know what's amazing that in the same book of Revelation, Jesus says, do not, do not tolerate that woman Jezebel. Yeah. Yeah. And he's talking about the demon, the spirit. Yeah. I'm not talking, not flesh and blood, but let's just say it was a spirit. Okay? So it has nothing to do with the woman. The, a true spirit of prophecy opposes and exposes the spirit of Jezebel. You don't tolerate it. The moment that you tolerate the spirit, it would wrap around you and try to kill you. Choke the anointing out of you. And that's why you see churches that are not filled no more. People are heavy, they're tired, they're fatigued because they don't want to come to church because they're being wrapped by the spirit of Jezebel. And it's killing the anointing out of them. It's choking the breath out of them. Wow. Have you guys ever been put on the headlock? I know I have. And when they put you on the headlock, when you're in a real fight, when they're putting you on the headlock, you can't breathe. Next thing you know, you feel like you're passing out. Oh, I can't breathe. And then you get, it's like you're passing out. When you see people that are spiritually fatigued, that means they're under spiritual warfare. The anointing is being choked out. And you know that you don't have to allow that to happen. He says, don't tolerate it. If you see that happening, you have to fight. God has already given you the sword to fight. For the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. You got to speak with the Word of God. When Satan was in the desert being tempted by Satan, when Jesus was in the desert being tempted by Satan, he spoke his own word. Satan had no way to come in because the Word of God was too powerful. So he left them. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay. For example, why do I say that the spirit of prophecy always opposes and exposes this Jezebel spirit that's trying to weigh people down? We see this example in the book of Matthew chapter 3 where John the Baptist, somebody say John the Baptist. We're going to get somewhere with this. He exposed the Pharisees for their hypocrisy and even called them a brood of vipers. A viper is a snake. Called them a brood of vipers because they would say something, but they didn't practice it. And they would weigh people down with all these burdens, but never lift a finger to help them. So people were burdened. Is this hard to serve God? They were burdened. They, 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 they were bound. They weren't set free. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen? He called them a brood of vipers. He exposed them. <laughs> John was a no joke. The prophet John was no joke. He'll tell you how it is. He, didn't, he, he wasn't worried about what he looked like. The Bible says he was dressed in camel's hair. He ate locusts. His breath probably smelled bad, but he'll, he'll come to your face and he'll speak it how it is. Like, listen, you a hypocrite. You ain't doing right. You brutal viper. Are we understanding? So the true prophet always opposes and exposes the spirit of Jezebel. Or the greater example is when John opposed King Herod for having relations with his brother's wife, Herodias. And he told him and her that what you're doing is wrong and is a sin before the, before the eyes of God. And we see the spirit of Jezebel come to effect in this story. We see that this woman by the name of Herodias said, I want John dead. And the Bible says that her daughter danced for, John, for, for, for Herod and, and, and all his guests. And he was impressed and said, whatever you ask, even half my kingdom, I will give it to you. Yeah. So the daughter came to the, to the mom and the mom was ready to, to, to what she wanted to do. We see the spirit of Jezebel still trying to kill the prophet. What do you want, mom? I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Oh my God. Because he opposed the spirit of Jezebel. Wow. Hallelujah. The spirit of Jezebel is still at work. Still at work. Hallelujah. At work. Look what Jesus said in the book of Matthew. Look what Jesus said in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 13 and 15. For all the prophets and the law have prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has an ear, let him hear. So you're telling me that Elijah or John is Elijah. 
Because remember, remember this, that Elijah never finished his, his race. The Bible says he never died. The Bible says God took him up to heaven in a chariot. That means there was still something that needed to be completed with John. So we see Jesus right here say, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has an ear, let him hear. Wow. Praise God. Look what the, all right, the last chapter in your Bible before the New Testament is the book of Malachi. The last prophecy that we read about in the Old Testament that was given was this one. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great day of the dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And this is where a lot of people have misinterpreted this. Whether you believe it or not, uh, if you believe that John... Is, or Elijah is one of the olive trees that's on you to live, I believe, but I have a teaching on that that makes too much sense. So this was the last prophecy given in the, in the, in, in, in the Old Testament. And we see that John was on a mission to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. He was preparing the people for the coming of Christ. The birth of Christ. He was preparing them. Hallelujah. He was preparing the bride of Christ. Glory to Jesus. And it's not a mistake that that was the last prophecy in the Old Testament. And when we read in the very next book from Malachi to, 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 to Matthew, Jesus then says, if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah to come. I mean, it's right there, right in our face, like literally right there. And, and that smashes a whole lot of theology right there. So Jezebel in the Old Testament never succeeded in killing the prophet John, so his race wasn't over. He has still had a purpose to complete because God's work through Elijah still needed to be fulfilled. What am I trying to say by this is that you are not going to leave this earth until your purpose is fulfilled. Do we have anybody that's over 65 here? Raise your hand. It's fine. Don't worry about what people think. You got, all right. You're still here because God hasn't fulfilled because God hasn't fulfilled His work with you. Or do you have anybody over seventy here? Raise your hand. You're still here because God hasn't fulfilled your purpose with you. Do we have anybody over seventy-five? Look at that. You're still here because you have a purpose. Maybe there's somebody that God's going to speak through through you. No, uh, hold on a second. Do we have anybody over eighty here? Raise your hand. Hallelujah. Amen. Blessed man. You're still here. Because you still have a purpose. And when you complete your purpose, then you can go in peace. There's still some people that need to hear the words that God has put in your mouth. And keep in mind that John was the forerunner of Jesus to prepare, to prepare the day of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Now, this is where we're going to like hit the nail on the head to show you that John was Filled also with the Holy Spirit, but with the spirit of Elijah. And the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 13, 17, it says, But the angel said to him, and it's talking to Zechariah, uh, John's dad, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Look at this. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also, be, he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. But right here, it's telling me that John came in the power and spirit of Elijah. He is the Elijah to come. So that is why the spirit of Jezebel ended up seeking to kill this prophetic power. Because he was a preacher of the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Whenever you preach Jesus, you become a high valuable target of Jezebel. You become not just a, a, a target of, of the kingdom of darkness, but you mandatory become a target of Jezebel. 
Who, who wants to preach the gospel here? Raise your hand. It comes with a price. I'm going to tell you something. It comes with a price. Your faith will be tested. You preach the gospel, you become a target. Who wants to preach the gospel? Yeah. Now, less hands were, were risen after I said this. <laughs> preach the gospel. You become a target of this demon. Listen to me. Ever since I started preaching, whoo, I felt, wait, I've been attacked in every way you could think of. But I have to stand my ground. The Bible says do not tolerate this woman Jezebel. Amen? So in the Old Testament, Elijah still had a purpose. It's the reason why when he wanted to kill himself, nothing was able to happen. Because he had a purpose still to complete. Two purposes in the Old Testament he still had to complete. That was to uh, anoint Elisha as his successor, as prophet, but also to anoint a, 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 a king in place of Ahab. And that was Jehu. Jehu. Jehu? <laughs> Jehu? Wait, was Donald Trump's name Donald J. Trump? No, right? Yeah. Donald Jehu? <laughs> and the Bible says that Jehu was like really, he was like, you could see it if you read it. He didn't have the experience to be a king, but he was reckless. He was, he was, a, he was, he was a fighter. And after he was anointed, he rode straight to, 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 to Jezebel's place. And the Bible says that when he rode, he looked up towards the window and Jezebel put makeup on. And then one of the servants came out and he, he said to the servant, are you with me? And the servant said, I'm, I'm with you. Of course I'm with you. If I ain't with you, you're going to kill me. He says, I throw Jezebel out the window. <laughs> do, do you see the purpose that needed to be completed? That demon was... was and whatever the prophet Elijah prophesied came to pass because the dogs licked her, 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 her blood. And then finally, after uh, uh, he, he, he anointed Elijah as successor, he was taken to heaven because the purpose wasn't completed. But then we see the purpose being complete here. Now keep in mind that Elijah was also a forerunner to a king called Jehu. He needed to prepare the way for Jehu to come in. That's powerful. This is a foreshadowing. And Jehu was the one that ended up pulling down the strongholds by the name of, of Jezebel. Listen to me, this, this, this has a foreshadowing. And the spirit of Elijah was at work through the prophet John. Elijah is now finishing his race in purpose. We see that he was beheaded. We see it in the story, in the book of Matthew. But before he was beheaded, he was a forerunner for the king of all kings, Jesus Christ who will later go on to destroy the powers of Satan, hell, and the grave. Yes. Yes. You got to understand that it all has a purpose. Hallelujah. It all has a purpose. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now Elijah finishes his race on earth. Hallelujah. Yes. And then he was promoted to heaven. Thank you, promoted to heaven. For finishing his race. Somebody give Jesus Christ a hand of applause for that. Why did I speak about this? What does this have to even do with us? Remember, he was a forerunner for Jesus. He prepared the people for the coming of Jesus. What does this even have to do with us? Because... We are called to prepare the bride for the return, the second return of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Yes. Turning the hearts of the lost back to God through the message of the gospel, which is the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Yes. We are called to turn the hearts of the people back to God. Yes. So we carry that anointing of, of Elijah. Yes. We carry the spirit of prophecy. Yes. So because we carry that spirit, we become a target. Amen? Amen. Don't, be, don't, don't ever be afraid to preach the gospel. Don't ever be afraid to preach the gospel. No matter what it costs you. It may cost you your life. But don't ever be afraid to preach the gospel. Because in doing so, you will be promoted too. Now, 
I want to speak on four things that happened when Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. There were four things that happened. I want you to understand this because this is going to give you a greater understanding. If you are being under attack, this is going to give you understanding who might be attacking you. Amen? Four things that happen that we can read in the Bible. The Bible says that Elijah ran for his life. Fear. Okay? So, so, fear. That was, that was the first one. The second, the second thing that happens when you are under spiritual warfare is you isolate yourself. You isolate yourself. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel like going. And you hide yourself in the cave. In, in other words, you, you're in that room watching TV. This is a sign that you are under spiritual attack. You're afraid and you isolate yourself. I'm getting somewhere with this. The third thing that happens is exhaustion. You feel tired all the time. You feel fatigued spiritually. You can't even pray. Even though you know you should pray and you're not doing nothing, you're at the table, you're, I should pray, but I just don't feel like praying. A sign that you are facing oppression. And the fourth thing that happens is you get depressed. I want this congregation to be honest. Because you, you, you can't be said, I can't, I can't know what you're going through if, you don't, if you're not honest. If you've been feeling any of these, fear, isolation, exhaustion, you, feel, you don't feel like praying, or you feel depressed, raise your hand. Look, 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 look at that. Almost everybody. We are under attack. Do you, do you understand what's happening in your life? There's a reason why you're being attacked. Because the enemy doesn't want you to finish your race. Listen to me, listen to me. Everybody listening under the sound of my voice. As much as I have a purpose and Pastor Kalo has a purpose, you have a purpose. And your purpose is great or probably even greater. You don't, you don't have to be up here to be doing this to, be, to, to, to do, run your good, good race and be great. Your purpose is greater. And the enemy is going to do anything in his strength possible to stop that purpose. The Bible says that Elijah ran in the power of God. And in the midst of his running, here comes a messenger to try to stop his momentum. After that messenger came, the Bible says he was afraid and ran for his life. After facing 400 false prophets the day before on Mount Carmel, he defeated 400 men. He ran from one woman. Have you ever, like, did something and you just had victory or something great happened, but the next day something bad happens? You're like, oh, my God, why is this happening to me again? I was just gaining momentum. My marriage was just good. We were just having a good time. My finances were just good. What just happened? It just came out of nowhere. This spirit is trying to stop your momentum. Are we understanding now? So when these four things mix up, the next thing that comes knocking at your door is suicide. Why do you think there's so much suicide right now? As a matter of fact, last year a few pastors committed suicide. Why do you think suicide is at an all-time high now? And leadership and, 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 and churches, not, not just in churches, in general, because the devil, the, the enemy knows the anointing of your purpose and he's trying to stop you from your purpose. And he's trying to stop those that are called and have a purpose. Great men. People that were great. Committing suicide. People that have a voice. Like that man from the, from the food show, he committed suicide. It's, it's, it's amazing that he could have spoke a message and millions would have received it and millions would have turned. But the enemy knew that. Had to try to take him out before he could give, before he could first give his life to God and speak that purpose. Somebody say, I have a purpose. I have a purpose. Say it loud, I have a purpose. I have a purpose. You have a voice, you see that? Yeah. The enemy doesn't want you to open your voice, to open your mouth, to speak the gospel. To speak. Yeah. 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 Glory to Jesus. Suicidal, wow. So I looked up the word depression, and of course, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's bound or it's connected to the word pressure or, press, or pressing. What do boa constrictors do to his prey? 
squeezes them, it presses them. Because if it squeezes and presses them, it will cut the circulation. And it dies. Do you know that the Holy Spirit is like your circulation? Do you know that Jesus Christ, right before he, 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 um, right before he did whatever he did, right, through the cross, he spoke to his disciples and he breathed on them and it said, receive the Holy Spirit. <sighs> he breathed on them. Do you know that when God created man, the Bible says, <sighs> he breathed life into him. So the spirit of Python, the spirit of Jezebel, the, the, the witchcraft spirit, will always try to choke that breath out of you. Why do you think you feel tired and you're just not uh, excited about church the way you know that you should be? It's not because a good word is not being preached. A good word is being preached. It's that you're being choked. And you know that you're being choked now. So if you don't do nothing now, time is going to wrap because the devil's like, oh, now they know that that was me. So the devil's going to try to even hurt you even more now. Because the truth will set you free and he don't want you to be free. You got to fight in the name of Jesus. Julio, you got to fight. You got to fight, Leo. You got to fight, Erica. Pastor Kato, you got to fight with all that you have. We have gained momentum. Pastor Tom, you got to fight. Randy, Pastor Randy, you got to fight with all that you have. Prophet John, you got to fight in the name of Jesus. Dean, you got to fight in the name of Jesus. Because if you don't fight now, he's going to choke out the things that God has placed inside of you. You got to fight now. The day of war is today. The day of salvation, you got to fight. Joe, you got to fight with all that you have. Because the devil's going to try to take everything that God has given you. Trying to choke it and kill it. Now you know what it is. Now you got to fight in the name of Jesus. Now you can call that thing out. Let go of my family. Let go of my finances. Let go of my ministry. Let go in the name of Jesus. Let go in the name of Jesus. Let go in the name of Jesus. Let go of my marriage in the name of Jesus. Let go, Jezebel. Let go, Spirit of Python. You gotta let go. Receive in the name of Jesus. You gotta let go, Jezebel. You have no power in this place. We will stand. We will rise. We will fight with the power that God has given us. Hallelujah. Let go of my people. Let go of my people. Let go of my people. This house is free to worship. This house is full of the Holy Spirit. Let go of my people, Python Spirit. Come out in the name of Jesus. Spirit of Jezebel, leave. You are not welcome in this place. Hallelujah. Let go. Let go. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If there was a, a python wrapped around you right now, you think you're going to let that thing kill you? You're going to bite? You're going you're gonna to punch? You're going to fight? You got to fight right now. Whatever it takes. I'm biting that thing back. Whatever it takes. Somebody say whatever it takes. The devil thought, the devil thought that he was going to take this ministry out. Sending witches our way. Sending false words our way. Sorcerers our way. No! We're going to fight. We know already. We know who they are. We know where they came from. And we're not going to allow it. We're not going to tolerate it. We're going to stand on the word of God. Somebody say pressure. My second point that I want to speak on is understanding why you are under pressure. Thank you, brother. Understanding why you are under pressure. You feel weak. You feel like running away. You feel intimidated. You're not intimate with God the way you used to, and you always feel exhausted. You feel pressed on every side. You feel pressed on every side. 
These are symptoms of a spiritual, a spiritual attack. And I'm 100% sure you are facing spiritual warfare. As a matter of fact, you know that you're in the right place when these things begin to happen to you. <laughs> so why are you going to run away and try to go to a so-and-so church thinking that you're going to find it there? If, if you're not being attacked and you're in a different church, that means that the anointing ain't there. And you know, the devil ain't going to attack where the anointing is not. But when you're in the right place, the devil will always try to attack you so that you don't come. That's how you know that you're in the place that God has for you. That's how you know that you're in the place that's speaking truth. That's how you know that you're in the place that the Holy Spirit abides. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm 100% sure you're facing spiritual warfare. So I just want to remind you what Proverbs Chapter 21, verse 31 says that though the horse is prepared for the day of battle, victory belongs to God. Amen. Though the enemy has risen up against your house, though the enemy has risen up against your marriage, though the enemy has risen up against your workplace, though the enemy has risen up against you in any area, I want you to know that he prepared his chariots, but victory belongs to God. You remember that story where Elisha, the prophet, when he was with his servant in the mountains, and the Bible says that a whole army encamped around them to kill him. And the servant was afraid. And he said, why are you afraid? And there was only two of them by the physical eyes. And the, and, and, and the servant said, look, they're, they're, they're surrounding us. They're surrounding all the places. We're about to die. And the prophet turned around and said, if you only knew who was with us. For there are more that are here with us than those that are against us. And he prayed that the servant's eyes be open. And the Bible says the servant's eyes are open. And he saw the, the armies of heaven surrounding them. Hallelujah. Somebody praise God. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. <laughs> we have a great army. Yeah. You know how they say America got the greatest army? <laughs> They must not know about my God. Yeah. They must not know about the armies of heaven. Hallelujah. Somebody praise Jesus. I, I like that shirt that he has. Brother, stand up real quick. Stand up. Come here. You know how Donald Trump says, let's make America great again? Come here. Look over there. Let's make Jesus great again. Let's make the church great again. Let's make the house of God great again. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pressure. Somebody say pressure. pressure. Look at what uh, our apostle Paul says. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Ooh-wee! We are pressed on every side. Pressed on every side, but not crushed. You can't, you can't, you, the, the devil can't kill you. You have a purpose. Somebody say, I have a purpose. I want you to know that God, because you have a purpose, God has not left your side. Though it may seem like you're in this furnace alone, God has not left your side. Though it may seem like you're fighting this thing alone, I want you to know that in the midst of these trials, God has not left your side. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to Jesus. In the book of 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he that is in this world. So with this being said, Elijah felt the pressure of Jezebel. Elijah felt the pressure of Jezebel. And I'm not here to tell you that you're not going to feel this pressure. That's why you're feeling the pressure. It doesn't mean that you're not victorious. It just means that you have a purpose. It just means that your purpose is so great that the enemy is trying to kill you. That's how you know that you are great. That's how you know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's how you know that you are in the right place. And the enemy is going to try to stop you. Sister, let me get that real quick. The enemy is going to do everything and his little tiny strength to stop you. Because the Bible says, the Bible says that Christ already overcame this devil. Okay? Something I want to share. I had to hide it because my son Nathaniel was trying to play with it. 
Hallelujah. So God will use your enemies. Do you understand that God will use your enemies? He'll use your enemies. Wow. Thank God for, thank God for the people that spoke bad about me. Thank God for the people that didn't believe in me. Thank God for all the trials that I had to go through. Thank God for all the pain that I had to go through. Thank God for all the people that abandoned me. Hallelujah. Thank God. So though the enemy will rise up against you, he will not be able to destroy you. Amen. As a matter of fact, the proof of this is that in the book of Revelation, it says that the camps of God, the people of God, the children of God will be surrounded by all the nations. But the Bible says fire will come out from God and destroy all of them. Last, thing I che- last time I checked, I'm grafted in, 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 into the bosom. I'm grafted in, in, into Abraham. We, we are children of God in this place. I hope so. Let me rephrase that. Not everybody's a child of God. I've got to be honest. Amen? You know that somebody, let, let, let's say you see my daughter, you'll be like, that's got to be Pastor Javier's daughter because he, he, it looks like her. It looks like him. Or, or you know that Nathaniel is my son because he's always running around and I'm always running around like, that's got to be his son. You know that you're a child of God because you begin to act like God. You begin to look more like him daily. Amen? But if you ain't looking like God in the way that you act, in the way that you live, you know that you ain't a child of God yet. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when Satan speaks his native language, a lion, that's his native language. If you're continuously lying, you know that the truth ain't inside of you. Two waters can't be in one place, salt and fresh water. Oil and water don't mix. You can't be hot and cold at the same time. You got to choose one. Either you with God or you against God. Amen? So believe it or not, pressure, somebody say pressure. Pressure is the opportunity for promotion. And, it, and it's, it's funny because uh, Randy was speaking something, but I didn't want to give him this part of my message because it's going to mess up my message. We were speaking yesterday, remember? Speaking about pressure, I said, this guy. Pressure is the opportunity for promotion. Well, why do you say that, Javier? So you're telling me that when I'm being attacked, when I'm facing these issues, I'm close to being promoted? Uh, who's ever seen that movie Courageous here? At the end of the movie, uh, the guy, Javier, was being tested. He was put in a place of pressure to lie. But in the movie, he decided not to lie. He decided to stand with integrity. And because he didn't lie, he was promoted in his company. What I'm trying to say is that pressure is an opportunity for promotion. Who's under pressure here again? Raise your hand. You're about to get promoted. Keep standing. Amen. If you believe it, give God a hand of applause. Uh, Do you know that those that come to knock you down will actually be a stepping stone to take you higher? Those that come to knock you down will become the stepping stone to take you higher. Because the Bible says the enemy will fall into his own trap. So amazing that the Bible says when, when, you at, when, when, when you're living right, even your enemies will be a piece of you with you. That's powerful. Your very enemies, when they come to knock you down, when they try to destroy your purpose and destiny, will become the stepping stone that God will use to launch you to the next place. The enemy doesn't know that God will use his evils, his pressures... Only for your success. Remember that story with Joseph? Though they meant it for evil, God turned it into good. All right, how about this one? Oppositions of winds is the very thing that takes planes into higher altitudes. If there's no wind, if there's no pressure, the plane can't go higher. So when it faces pressure and its wings are open, it's able to elevate higher. You got to open your wings. When that thing comes against you, you got to say, hold on a second. Oh, here it goes. Come on, baby. Come on, Jezebel. Let's do it. That's the pressure. I got I to position myself because I'm about to go higher. 
You can't see it as, oh, I'm under this pressure. I'm going to go over here and hide. <laughs> Mama. Right? No, you got to better. Hold on a second. This is an opportunity for me to go higher. But what you do in the midst of pressure determines if you go higher or not. What you do in the midst of your issues, what you do in the midst of your problems, determines if you get promoted to the next level or not. My saying to you is, what are you doing in the midst of the chaos that you're facing? Are you trying to wrestle with it? Or are you saying, God, I'm going to spread my wings? Spreading the wings is just another, thing, another way of saying, I'm going to have faith. That this thing is the very thing that you're going to use to take me higher. Oh, bring it, bring it, bring it. So, hallelujah, yeah, praise God. So whatever you do in the midst of that pressure determines if you go higher or not. Why would anybody in their right mind say, say that pressure is an opportunity for promotion? Because the, my greatest victories have come from my greatest pressures and battles. All right, for an example, David, before he became a king, he was just a young boy. His father, Jesse, sent them out to bring cheese and bread to his brothers. The Bible says that while he was minding his business, going to go deliver some cheese and bread to his brothers, that he heard a giant defiling the armies of God. And the Bible says that all the men, all the great warriors of Israel, even the king, hallelujah, was afraid. Nobody stepped to this giant, hallelujah. And the giant was in a place that we are all afraid to go to. He was in a valley between one mountain and another mountain. But the Bible says when this kid, a young boy by the name of David, heard this demon, heard this giant speaking against the, the, the kingdom of God, speaking against Israel, the Bible says that he said, who's that giant? And what would the king do if somebody kills him? Out of all the men, a boy stepped up. And the Bible says that he said, I'll fight him. Yes. I'll fight him. So, I'm trying to, you know, I'm not, I'm not that small, but I'll fight him. And all, these, and all these big men and his brothers say, you, man, go watch your, uh, your, your, your father's little bit of sheep. Little did he know that he was going to become the shepherd of Israel. Because he started off with a little bit. But his faithfulness in the midst of pressure. Watch this. And we got this giant. I would call, I would call him fear because fear is a giant. And, and by the way, I got this story in my new book that I'm writing, and I'm almost done with it. It's going to be powerful. And this giant by the name of fear kept speaking. Just like that woman Jezebel spoke fear, and, and Elijah ran. He was afraid. The whole nation of Israel was afraid, but one. Somebody say, but one. No. That one is me. Somebody say, that one is me. And the Bible says that finally, Saul gave him the authorization to fight. And he had no sword. He had no shield. He had no javelin. But here comes this giant man, probably measuring 12 feet. They called him the champion of the Philistines. He never lost a battle. But here comes this giant sword, shield, javelin. And the Bible says that David, David said, you come at me with sword and spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that, 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 that David reached into his pouch and took a stone and tossed it at the giant and the giant died and he killed the giant with his very sword. But keep this in mind, keep this in mind. The very thing that was the pressure that was against Israel, after David killed this giant, he was promoted. Little did David know while he was shepherding his father's sheep that he was just being obedient to his father's voice, going out to, 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 the, to the valley of, of war to bring his brother cheese and bread, that that was going to be the day that his life was going to change. Hallelujah. Somebody praise God. He was just minding his business. But here comes pressure. Somebody say pressure. Hallelujah. Here comes. Come on. Give me some pressure, God. I need to get promoted. You got you to gotta be like a warrior. Give me something to fight. Hallelujah. Give me something to battle. I want to be promoted. Yeah. But we got these Christians that are afraid of battles. Don't be afraid of battling. Hallelujah. Because battling is the opportunity of promotion. But what you do in the midst of the opposition, what you do in the midst of battle, determines if you get promoted or not. 
So when you think there's pressure in your house, your husband ain't treating you right, your wife ain't treating you right, and you start going at each other's neck, you ain't going to get promoted. Little did David know that that pressure was the thing that was going to catapult him to his purpose and destiny. (laughs) That's powerful. The very pressure was going to launch him. Ever since that day, his life was never the same. Before you can get to the top of the mountain, you must first go to a valley. Wherever there's a mountain, there's always a valley. And people want to be on top of the mountain, but they don't want to go through the valley. Somebody praise God. I'm almost finished. David was promoted. He became one of the greatest kings of Israel, Jesus. Promoted, amen? He wasn't perfect, but he was promoted. God will use your enemies. God will use your pressures all your situations in life, only to push you into a higher place. So you ask God, take me to the next level. God, take me to the next place. God, give me a global ministry. God, give me a global voice. God, give me supernatural breakthrough. God, take me high. I want to go to higher levels, God. And God's like, you sure you want to go to higher levels? (laughs) Pastor, you sure you want to go to higher levels? I want to go to higher levels. But God is not going to take you in the way you think he's going to take you. Like, you know, like some of us be like, you know what, I'm about to be on TVN, I'm about to appear on TVN, I'm going to preach to the whole world. But those people that are there, they pay the price. People just see the final result. They don't see what you have to go through to get to where you're at. Are we understanding? They just see you polished, but they don't see you in the furnace. So you want to get promoted, okay, God will promote you, but he's not going to promote you the way you think he's going to promote you. There's going to be some pressure involved, amen? uh, In order for diamonds to form and become diamonds, they're formed in the the earth while there's pressure. There's got to be pressure, amen? There has to be pressure. Glory to God. So God will use your enemies and your situations only to push you to a higher place, to create the anointing and the momentum that you need To go to the place that he has ordained for you. Amen? Amen. Pressure produces power and energy. Somebody say this. Pressure Pressure. produces Produces. power Power. and energy. When something is contained, this thing is contained. This rocket represents who you are. Okay? When something is contained and pressure is produced, eventually, when enough pressure is applied... It creates the energy needed to give a force push and cause a breakthrough to whatever it is that's applied. It's a possibility that you've been in a position like this for a long time. And God is saying, I can't have you in that position too long. So in order for me to launch you to the next place, I got to put some pressure in your life. Are we understanding? Little does the devil know that the more he attacks me, pressure. Little does the devil know that the more he attacks my family, pressure. Little does the devil know that when he attacks my ministry and speaks about me and say, I'm too young, I don't have education, I don't have nothing, I'm a failure, I didn't do nothing with myself. How did he get there? Little does the devil know that that pressure that's being applied is the very thing that God is going to use to catapult me to the next place. Somebody say pressure! Pressure! So you want to go higher? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary Pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. 
One more time. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Wow. I thank God for all the pressure. Everything that I had to go through to get to where I'm at today. God gets all the glory. You know, I'm going to say a little testimony and I'm almost finished. After I gave my life to uh, Christ at the age of 17, a year before something happened. Then I gave my life to Christ at the age of 17. I was sold out for Christ at a young age. At the age of 17, the Holy Spirit, the power of the manifested power of God came over my life and baptized me in my room. I'll never forget this. It was the most powerful event that ever happened to me. The power of God came over me. I couldn't control it. I started dancing, and the person that was in the room with me said, the Holy Spirit is here. Hug him. And when I went to hug the Holy Spirit, the arms of the Holy Spirit ran around me, and my shirt went like this. It creased it, and his arm was holding me tight. And then, out, and then he baptized me in the fire. Fire all over. But to make this short, little did I know that God was preparing me that that was good, but I didn't know what was going to happen next. And then for what happened at the age of 16, something that I didn't do, once I turned 18, I had a court date, and I was innocent. I was serving God at the moment. I was sold out for Christ. Immediately, I was put into prison. I said, God, why, why, why this, God? Why did I have to go through this, God? Why do you, God, I'm serving you, God, I'm serving you. Why is this happening to me? But no response. Sometimes God is silent. And I was like, please, God, take me out of here. Every day felt like a year. I did seven months in prison. I didn't understand what God was doing. So you got to understand that I didn't know how to read. I didn't know how to write. I was in special ed classes most of my life, to those that don't know. I learned how to read and I learned how to write and spell in prison. I learned how to spell playing Scrabble in prison. Can you believe that? I learned how to read, reading the Bible in prison. I'm a miracle. I'm a, I'm a, what you see here is a miracle. Listen to this. Listen to this. Little did I know that God was, he had to bring me all the way down to bring me all the way up. Little did I know that that's the very thing that God used to prepare me. I read the Bible, I don't know how many times in prison I had nothing else to do. Little did I know that that's what God was doing because if I was out in the streets, he would have never had me to, uh, pre to prepare me. He had to place me in a place where I didn't want to be, a place of pressure. As a matter of fact, my first day in prison, the guy that was sleeping under me murdered three people. We were in a room this small. Like, the, 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 the toilet is right there. They don't got no covers or nothing. I was like, God, no, 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 this can't be happening to me. No, God, I, I felt like I couldn't breathe. God had me in the furnace at a young age. I was a kid. I was a kid. I was just like 18 years old. I was just turned 18. I was just a baby. But little did I know that that's the very thing that God used. I thank God for it. I didn't understand it at that moment, but I thank God for it. The Holy Spirit is truly my teacher. I have no other teacher. I have no, there's nobody else that I go, yeah, he taught me. The Holy Spirit is my teacher. That when you have the Holy Spirit of God, he will teach you everything. He will show you what you must do. The breath that we need. Don't let the enemy choke this breath out of you. Don't let the enemy choke the anointing out of you. Because the Holy Spirit is your very compass. The Holy Spirit is your guide. The Holy Spirit is your greatest coach. The Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher. He's your father. He's everything. He's your best friend. The Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And the enemy wants you to be divided from the Holy Spirit. We can't let that happen, people. We can't let that. This is just the beginning. I know where God is going to take me. See, see, you, you got to understand who you are in Christ. You got to believe. I know that this is just the beginning. This is, listen to me. 
to, to everyone listening, God is going to take you higher if you put yourself in a position to go higher. What, determining what you do in the midst of your pressure determines if you go higher or not. Amen? Amen. Give Jesus Christ a hand of applause. And I finish with this. Because we always have to honor our Lord and our Savior, the greatest, Jesus Christ, the King of all glory. Yeshua Messiah. The great King. A King in the order, in the order of Melchizedek. The one who has the power of, of, of all, of heaven and hell. The power of life and death. He holds the keys. Jesus Christ. There's no greater power Hallelujah. There's no one greater. There's no throne that's greater. There's no president or king in this world that's greater. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Amen. Satan thought he was stopping Jesus. <laughs> if anyone felt the greatest pressure in this world, it was Jesus. Amen. When Jesus was being whipped, when Jesus was being spat on, when they were punching him in his face, prophesy who hit you. When they ripped his garments and gambled for his garments. When they, when they whipped him, hallelujah, and, and, and his skin was being ripped apart. When they pulled his beard apart. When they took a crown of thorns and crushed it into his head. You see, we see little Easter stories, but they crushed the thorns into his skull. Bloody, disfigured, skin hanging, bones showing, organs showing from all the whipping that he took. I can just imagine what, while that was going on, the kingdom of darkness was celebrating, thinking that they defeated the king of all kings. And you could just imagine the pressure that Jesus felt. While, while he was walking with the cross on his back, he couldn't even carry it. Disfigured, disformed, almost broken. I could just imagine that the devil was laughing and say, I got you. I got you where I want you. He was carrying the cross in the marketplace, humiliated, half naked, humiliated, carrying the cross. People pointing and saying, ain't that the one that was performing all these miracles? Ain't that the one that said he's the bread of life? That if you eat the word that he has, you shall never die. Ain't that the one that shouted, come to me, those who thirst, and I will give you water that when you drink of it, you will never thirst again? But yeah, he looks thirsty. Ain't that the one that healed the blind and those that were sick? Ain't that the one that raised dead people, but he looks almost dead? Ain't that the one that rode in a donkey a couple of days ago and people were praising him and laying garments at his feet? And as if that wasn't worst, he finally makes it to the hill called Golgotha. And they laid him on the cross. And they drove nails, stakes in his hand and in his feet. As if that wasn't worse, they raise up the, the cross and they start shouting, He saved others, but He can't save Himself. Thank you, Jesus. But He hung on that cross. And I could just imagine the parade that hell was having. The torture, the torment, the humiliation, the cross, 
the two days in the tomb, the time that he spent in hell, was exactly what God used for the plan of redemption. The pressure that he had was the very thing that took him to his glory. Was the very thing that God used for the plan of salvation. Though the enemy meant it for evil, God turned it to good. If anyone, if anyone in this world could say, I felt pressure, it was my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he did it for you and me. It's a possibility that there's someone that needs to be reached. And reaching them will cause pressure in your life. But that pressure will be worth it just to see one person saved. What seemed like defeat in the eyes of the enemy, this became the only door to escape condemnation and receive eternal salvation through Jesus Christ who conquered Satan, death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. The last scripture that I want to read is Hebrews 2, 14, 15. And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through, through, through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, and that is the devil. The pressure had a purpose. Somebody could shut those lights, so I'll put a light instrument to The pressure had a purpose. But the kingdom of darkness couldn't stop the momentum. And I'm here to tell you that your pressure has a purpose. And I'm here to tell you that though you may be going through the greatest pressure in your life, the greatest fire, you keep standing. Because God is going to use that pressure to launch you to your purpose and your destiny. That pressure right now that you feel, thank God for it. Because it's going to make you who God created you to be. If anyone out there says, I've been feeling pressure. I had momentum, but like the prophet Elijah when the messenger was sent to me, I, I fell asleep. I was afraid I ran. I've been feeling so much pressure. I just need your help. I need strength, man. I want to run in the power of the Holy Spirit like Elijah ran. I want to run this race that has been set before me, but I got so much pressure. I don't know where to start. I don't know who to turn to. That's you. And you say, I just, I know, today I know that that is the, the spirit that has been sent to try to stop my momentum. And today I, I, I want to fight this thing. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to stand and come to the front. Hallelujah. I believe right now, I believe right now is the time if this message was released, that this message has the anointing to pull this, this python spirit down in the name of Jesus. But you got to be obedient to come up. You can't be afraid. Don't worry about who's around you. Don't worry about what people are going to think about you. Worry about that thing coming off of you.